So last year I published a video on the channel describing the architecture behind the World Trade Center. I'll link it down below in case you guys wanted to see more about Yamasaki's incredible work and how it actually came to life. Today I wanted to make a video about how and why the World Trade Center actually collapsed and the ongoing speculation in the aftermath of 9-11. All of my sources are going to be linked down below and I do want to put a disclaimer out there. I'm an architecture student, not an engineer, and this information is not meant to contribute to ongoing conspiracy theories that float around. Lastly, this is your trigger warning. I will be using graphic footage ahead. 9-11, needless to say, is a very emotional day for many Americans. So here's a quick refresher. The original World Trade Center buildings one and two, aka the North Tower and South Tower respectively, were twin 110-story skyscrapers located in New York City's Lower Manhattan Central Business District. The North Tower was completed in 1972 and the South Tower was completed a year later. On September 11, 2001, the North Tower was hit at 8.46 a.m. by American Airlines Flight 11 and the South Tower was struck 16 minutes later by United Airlines Flight 175. The South Tower tragically fell at 9.58 a.m. and the North Tower collapsed around 10.30 a.m. On 9-11, we lost 2,977 lives to these terrorist attacks. And I also do wanna say I did find a lot of conflicting timelines out there. I'll link a couple down below that I referenced. Both seem to be credible. There's a lot of information going on out there, that's for sure. After this terrible tragedy, the National Construction Safety Team was responsible for conducting quote, fact-finding investigations of building failures that resulted in such a substantial loss of life. This team conducted a thorough investigation and also tested through computer simulations, the reasonings behind the tower's collapse. The first report of the World Trade Center investigations was officially released for public comment on June 23rd of 2005. The final report was published on October 26th, 2005. So it was an extensive report, but basically <laughs> here were their findings. So number one is that the impact of the planes severed and severely damaged the supporting columns of the World Trade Center and the impact the impact also damaged the spray fireproofing on these supports. The fireproof insulation did coat the steel trusses in the floors and also in the columns and this was their reasoning behind the widely dispersed jet fuel that was present in the towers. The second thing that they discovered was that the burning jet fuel was estimated to reach 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. Now this weakened the floors and the columns to the point where the floors themselves sagged which resulted in the perimeter structural columns warping inward. This bowing action led to a failure of the southern side of the north tower and the eastern side of the south tower. Now in all of my research I did find a lot of first-hand accounts from engineers. Basically a lot of these individuals contribute the tower's failings to these four things. Number one is that the insulation that protects the steel from high heat was compromised. Two, the sprinkler system of the building was damaged from the impact as well. Three, the aircraft sliced and cut too many interior structural members and it damaged others. And lastly, four, the shifted and it redistributed building loads were too great, therefore putting most of the columns under elevated states of stress. That was a lot of information that I just thrown at you. So I do wanna back up for a little bit and give us a moment to digest what was just said. Let's also talk about the fundamentals of the Twin Towers design. The design of the skyscrapers will of course play a role in how a tragic event will play out. If you remember from my first video, these skyscrapers were designed to be lightweight. It is estimated that the total weight of the structure was around 500,000 tons. The engineers of the structure designed the twin towers to withstand substantial wind loads with the great lateral load totaling 5,000 tons. The 208 foot by 208 foot building footprint was composed of 244 exterior columns, leaving the windows to be approximately 
approximately 22 inches wide. Narrow columns were a stylistic choice actually prevalent in Yamasaki's work as he did fear heights. And lastly, design-wise, there was a 87 foot by 130 foot core that was composed of 47 steel columns and was designed to support the weight of the tower. There were joists that connected this strong core structure to the perimeter. The floors ended up being four inch thick concrete on this steel deck and was supported by a six foot eight inch grid of prefabricated trusses. And I'm sure as you guessed, it did effectively carry the load between the core and exterior walls, freeing the office space of interior columns. This innovative design led the buildings to be so light and this egg crate construction slash design tactic explains why the rubble was only a couple stories high after the collapse of both towers. It really was an innovative structure. It really was. And it was this ongoing joke, I guess you can say, um, that the World Trade Center tower were composed of mostly air, 95% air. Now, when the aircraft impacted the tower, there's no argument that it did severely damage these external columns on this perimeter wall, but the redundant structural design was able to effectively shift the loads of the building to the remaining columns effectively. This is why the towers didn't immediately collapse on impact, but it was the explosion of the jet fuel which was approximately a third of the aircraft's total weight that was the principal cause of the collapse. It is approximated that there were 90,000 liters of jet fuel present. Now the fire itself is the most controversial part of the whole incident. Many people believe that the steel melted and I did find a lot of conflicting arguments as well. Once again, let's back up and digest these facts. Temperature and heat are related, but not the same. Temperature does not vary with the quantity of the material. Heat though is an extensive property which does vary with the amount of material. The jet engine's flames generated the most intense heat. The maximum flame temperature found in an independent case study using ambient temperature and pure oxygen is 3000 degrees celsius which is 5432 degrees fahrenheit. This study reduced the maximum flame temperature by two-thirds when using air, not pure oxygen. Therefore, the maximum flame temperature found for burning jet fuel is around 1,000 degrees Celsius, which is 1,832 degrees Fahrenheit. This independent, separate study does confirm the second findings in the official released report, which stated the burning jet fuel was estimated to reach 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. But also please understand and note that the temperature temperatures of the fire is not uniform everywhere. Because of this and thermal expansion of steel, this produced distortions in the structural steel and resulted in buckling failures. This is a general property of steel. It will distort and buckle when subject to non-uniform temperatures. Now, what is steel's melting point to begin with? Steel is an element of iron that has been processed to control the amount of carbon. Iron itself melts at 1,000 1510 degrees Celsius or 2750 degrees Fahrenheit. Steel therefore melts around 1370 degrees Celsius or 2500 degrees Fahrenheit, but it is known that structural steel begins to soften at around 425 degrees Celsius or 797 degrees Fahrenheit. It loses about half of its structural strength at 650 degrees Celsius or 1202 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Therefore, the failure of steel is due to these two factors. One, the structural steel lost strength due to the temperature of the fire. And two, because the fires were non-uniform, it led to distortion of steel and resulted in the loss of its structural integrity. Now, in every large buildings, there will be a series of very detailed calculations to ensure that the building can survive the loss of primary structural members. But because the impact of the plane shifted loads of multiple members once they failed, the building structure was overstressed. Think of this instance like a row of dominoes falling down actually. Hypothetically, engineers believe that the World Trade Center would have survived the loss of 
several exterior columns from the aircraft's impact if there was no fire. But it was really the fire that was the tipping point. Many engineers speculate that the fire really did cause the steel members to ultimately fail. I do also want to talk about the weight of the towers as well. Each floor was designed to support 13 tons beyond its own weight, but as you recall, each tower is about 500,000 tons. Now, as the joists of one or two floors gave way, the exterior bowing occurred the floor fell above them. Many of the trusses might have broken free because of the relatively weak connections between them and the columns. And as the floors above came crashing down on critical angle clips and lower floor joists, a domino effect ensued, and it caused these buildings to collapse within seconds. As this was happening, the perimeter columns had no lateral support, also causing them to buckle and fly outward. It is calculated that it hit the bottom with an estimated speed of 200 kilometers per hour. This also explains why the towers fell straight down instead of sideways. Let's talk design again. Do you think it was defectively designed? Personally speaking, I don't. I don't think an event like this was ever dreamt of as a possible horrific scenario that buildings would have to uh, prepare for, really. Skyscrapers were designed to support themselves for three full hours in a fire. Regardless, I do hope that this video helped clear things up. I do also hope that this can address some conspiracies out there. There has been this ongoing conspiracy theory actually that explosions were heard inside right before it collapsed and this led people to believe that explosives were carefully placed in the twin towers. It was a uh, inside job to collapse the Twin Towers and cause so much devastation. There was an interesting theory I discovered by a Norway material scientist, Christian Simensen, who reaffirms the fact that a mixture of water from the sprinkler system along with the molten aluminum from the melted aircraft hulls created the explosions. Simensen reported both scientific experiments and 250 reported disasters suffered by the aluminum in industry have shown the combination of molten aluminum and water releases an enormous explosion. This mixture led to these explosions that resulted in everything we've been talking about. The domino effect and crushing of floors and so on. Simensen defends his theory and believes the initial investigating team did not take into account that the aircraft also brought in 30 tons of aluminum into each tower. And it is known by the aluminum industry and material scientists that reactions of aluminum with water leads to violent explosions. This is why many believe this theory and that the tower's collapse is a result of a extremely energy rich aluminum water explosion. And if you aren't a material scientist, I'm not either, but they compare these types of explosions to a dynamite explosion. I do want to end with a lasting quote that I found in conducting all of this research for you guys. And it said, quantitative reasoning can help us sort fact from fiction. Stay safe out there and my sincere condolences if you have lost anyone to these devastating attacks. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Love you guys.